start our wonderful evening. Uh, my name is Johanna Rupp, and I'd like to welcome all of you to Book Passage. And thank you all so much for coming out this evening and supporting your local independent bookstore. It's really a wonderful cultural treasure that we have in the Bay Area, and I'm so pleased we're all supporting that stuff. Tonight, Book Passage is proud to welcome C.W. Gortner, best-selling author, former fashion executive, and the loved Book Passage Mystery Conference faculty. We're so pleased he's going to be back with us again for our 22nd annual Mystery Conference in July. So, thank you. Gordner is really known, though, for his many evocative and richly atmospheric historical novels, and his latest is no exception. Based on his lifelong adoration of Coco Chanel, Gortner's latest novel is filled with stunning details of the fashion icon's rise to fame. The book is simply as entrancing as Chanel herself, mesmerizing the reader with an intimate glimpse into her very mysterious, very glamorous, and very private world. So please join with me in a warm, warm welcome for C.W. Gordner. Red, I always eat before you guys, and I'm like, oh my god, do I have something on my teeth? <laughs> so, um, many people here know me, so this is even more awkward. Um, <laughs> but I'll talk a little bit about why this book, because all of my previous novels have been set in the 16th century. And uh, Chanel has actually always been an obsession of mine. I worked in fashion for many years. I went to the San Francisco, um, we call it FIDM, but it's uh, the Fashion Design and Marketing Institute. And I wanted to be a designer. That was my dream growing up, was I wanted to be a fashion designer. And of course, until I got to school and realized I can't sew a button, and cutting patterns completely defeated me. So I switched to a marketing degree, and um, my, for my end of the year thesis, for my graduation thesis, I did a marketing thing on Chanel. I presented four or five of her iconic designs, and I talked about how I'd have marketed them if she were still designing today. So she's always been a part of my my world growing up. I grew up in Southern Spain, and my mom wore Chanel. And I always remember she would wear the black sheath, and she'd put on all the pearls. And one time I asked her, why all pearls and no earrings? And she would turn to me and go, well, because Chanel says less is more. And there was a really beautiful Chanel boutique in Marbella in the, in the south of Spain that she took me to once. And I remember as a boy, I was a pretty grubby little boy. I liked to climb trees and run around with dogs and things like that. But going to the boutique, I remembered how amazingly ethereal it felt, like the oxygen was thinner in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and all the women kind of drifted around in this state of complete bliss with all this very expensive stuff. And <laughs> I was a boy, so I didn't understand, you know, the relevant cost of things. But I did realize when I watched my mom and these other women be in that boutique, how that clothing changed the way they felt and how they, they acted with each other. And my mom always floated out of there and was in a great mood for the rest of the day. <laughs> um, whether she bought a belt or a perfume or a dress. Mm -hmm. So that became my realization of how clothing can define us, how clothing can be catalyst for self-expression. And um, when I moved to the US, I was a very proper Spanish boy. And we went to school, we wore ties, we wore trousers, we wore coats. And my first year at high school, I had a horrible day because I got jeered at so much because everyone was in t-shirts and jeans. Mm -hmm. But I later on went into the drama department and found a lot of very exotic Baroque people who wore flamboyant scarves and purple, and you remember this. <laughs> <laughs> and I, again, it, it made me realize that clothing is a catalyst, that clothing can be not only what we put on, but how it makes us feel, what we, what we do. And Chanel understood that very much from the start. So after I graduated from my uh, fashion institute, I went to New York and worked in fashion for a number of years. And then came back to San Francisco and did the same. And I worked with a lot of really great designers. And the ones that persevered were always the ones that had this innate sense of what was coming before it arrived. So fashion requires a bit of a genius because it's so ephemeral. And um, you need to sort of anticipate a trend and know how to control it in order to be successful with it. And Chanel very much showed that, which is really amazing considering her background. And the designers I worked with also showed that. And that experience informed the writing of this book because I was able to understand some of the things that she went through having experienced it with designers. The need to create something, the need to find funding for it, how you present it, all of that. 
But I didn't start with this book, obviously. I did my tutor. So this book was born, um, I had delivered the tutor vendetta, and it was over the holidays. And I had this free time, and I'd get grumpy if I'm not writing. Mm -hmm. So I, I had been wanting to do this Chanel novel for a while, but it was beyond my brand. It, you know, my publisher wouldn't know about it. I was under contract for it. So I decided to just take a chance on the book, just see if I could get the voice, see if I could have some fun with it. And it was an amazing experience, because it, when you get published, um, you still enjoy writing, but you're writing for your reader, you're writing for your editors, you're writing for yourself as well. But you're, the way you approach the work is different. Um, because it's your job now. And I used to write, while well, I had a full-time job. So I would write on weekends, I'd write at night from 9 to 11. So going back and writing Chanel the way I did, I wrote the book on spec. I wasn't under contract, so I wrote the whole book before I did anything about it. And it gave me back that joy that I used to have in writing where I was just writing for the complete thrill of it without any expectation of what people were going to think. And I didn't even want to submit the book originally um, because I was liking it so much. When you surrender your book to your agent and to your editor, suddenly you're faced with people's opinions. And I didn't want people's opinions. I just liked the book and wanted to keep it. But when my editor, my agent finally said, I know you're working on something. You're always working on something. Send me pages. She thought it was a really magnificent approach to the story. And it's changed everything. It changed my publishing house because it was preempted by another publishing house on it. And it launched me into the 20th century. So it's, she's really been transformative for me. A little bit about the research for the book, because a lot of people seem to be interested in the research. I knew a lot about her before I started writing the book, obviously from a fashion perspective. So I knew all of her iconic things, the little black dress, the perfume, um, you know, the Jersey separates, which she started with. I knew all of that, but I knew very little about the woman behind it. I, I, I'd heard certain things, but um, I never focused on it. So when I began to research her book, her life, it really involved a lot of reading. There's been a lot of biographies written on her, and all of them take a slightly different take. And recent ones have been very condemning and critical of some of her activities during World War II. But one of the challenging things when you're writing these kind of novels in a life that's been so documented is that once you have all the facts and you know what you're going to cover, and there's only a finite amount of facts you can cover because a book is a finite amount of words and a life is not, um, then you have to get into the skin of your character, especially because I write in first person and I'm a guy. So I may know a lot about fashion, but you know I don't know about Chanel struggles until I try to get in there. So a lot of times what it involves for me research-wise is trying to get past the facts and get into a psychological area with, with my characters where I can figure out, based on what I've read on how they acted or what they said or what they did, why was it, they did doing that? What were the extenuating circumstances? Why it might have been going through their head? Um, you always know a book is working for you when you start to feel like the book is writing itself. And you always know a book is not working for you when you can't, you're constantly struggling to get a sense of what this character is feeling. I like to begin my writing when I feel I know enough about the character that I could throw her into any situation and I would know how she'd react to it. Fortunately, Chanel was very cooperative. Um, I also managed to contact um, through the Chanel archives uh, somebody who worked with her much later on in her life, after the 60s. And um, it was like mid-60s. And he got on the phone with me. He was really generous with his time and my broken French, his broken English. He described her physically to me, how she moved, what she looked like, um, how much she smoked, pretty much incessantly, um, and sort of her energy. And that's really, that's really important, because I've written about people that died you know, five, 600 years ago. There's no way I'm going to find anybody who knew them. Um, but to actually talk to somebody who knew this woman and had a sense of what she was like really helped inform my creation of her. Um, and that's important. I think one of the important things to recognize about Chanel is that she was abandoned as a child. She was born into a very impoverished background. Her mother was a seamstress, but one who worked in back store, the backs of stores, she took a mending. Her father was a vendor. He sold different wares in different marketplaces of, of France. It apparently wasn't a happy marriage. And when she was 12, when Chanel was 12, her mother died of tuberculosis, which was common in those days. And the father didn't want to take care of her. He didn't want to take care of his family. He didn't want the responsibility. Most of the Chanel men, historically, were wanderers. And he was just one in another line. So he broke up the family. He sold, her brothers were given, literally given to farmers, which was common to do with impoverished, impoverished children. 
And Chanel later on, years later, found out about her brothers where they were and all that, and they had a very rough time of it. While Chanel and her two sisters were sent to this common orphanage um, that was up in the mountains, in the middle of nowhere. And so from the, year, the age of 12, she lost trust in people, and especially trust in men. What's interesting about her time at the convent, though, is that it wasn't miserable. They nurtured her sewing skills, and also she got to be in this world of self-sufficient women. And they grew their own vegetables, they brought their own food, they did all kinds of sewing and mending, and they did trousseaus for women that were getting married, so she got to learn all this delicate needlework. And they were really, the nuns were always concerned that when their charges, when the girls left, that they would have a ways to make, make her their way in the world. Um, and then this is a world we have to bear in mind Chanel's born close to the turn of the century. So women have very few choices. So that they encouraged Chanel to do something with her needle and basically said, you know, you could work for a seamstress and you might even own your little shop. And imagine what came out of that. <laughs> um, so she had this interesting mistrust of people and, a, and a not wanting to ever indebt herself with people. Wanting to make sure that if she took something, she gave it right back. And she could be a really loyal friend and a very compassionate person, but it took a while to get to know her. And this man that I spoke with from France who worked with her said, at the beginning, she really was caustic and she'd put you off. But if she liked you, if she befriended you, she'd give you the world. So I found that a really interesting sort of trait to run through the book, because time and time again in her experiences in life, you see this come up. This struggle that she has between wanting to be independent, wanting to be free, wanting to control her own life, and the expectations of society where she, they think she should get married, they think she should have kids, and she, of course, she never did any of that. Um, and the other thing that I found really fascinating about her was her ability to not only foresee fashion, but how timed she was to the events in the world at that time. So when Chanel began doing, she started out doing hats, and then she moved into doing clothing. But the building that she got, that she leased for her boutique on Rue Gambon, where it stands to this day, there was another dressmaker in the building, so her lease prohibited her from making dresses. So she was really tired of the corset, the ruffle, the fruit platter hats, all of that stuff. And she was trying to figure out a way to get around this dressmaker thing. Because the dressmaker apparently was a nasty piece of work. It would come downstairs and sniff around a shop and be like, I see one dress. Mm -hmm. So she, at the time, was living with the love of her life, an, an Englishman named Boy Capel. And he had brought home Jersey pullovers that he used to play polo with. And she loved the feel of Jersey, the stretchiness of it, the ease of it, how she needed to use very little seams for it. And but it was a fabric that was done, we used for military underwear, sportswear, and boys' uniforms. Women wouldn't dare touch, you know, jersey. But she started creating these separate. So everything we know today about fashion, she's influenced. Prêt-à-porter is her. She, and she began the mixing, mixing and the matching. In those days, women went to their ateliers to be dressed, and women of society, in one-of-a-kind clothing. You spent hours at that today. You had tea. You were doted on everything else. But once you walked out with your outfit, you didn't socialize with the designer. Mm -hmm. they were, there were class distinctions. So you didn't expect to run into the opera, you didn't expect to run into parties, you didn't invite them to your parties. And Chanel thought that that was all really ridiculous. So when she began introducing these separate, she did it at a resort town called Deauville, where it would be a very up and coming place. And she presented all of these separates. She still was hand fitting people for them, but she had a certain array of sizes, you tried them on, and then she'd hand fit you for the outfit. Because she hadn't gone into mass production yet. Women were really suspicious, but the summer she opened the boutique was blazing hot. And she was running around town in this very loose coat with a loose skirt, you know, a typical Chanel outfit, and she had all business cards and you know, people were asking where she got her clothes, and she'd be like, Chanel, Chanel, Chanel. So wow. women were suspicious about these outfits, and she attracted some really high-end society women that could make a reputation, but they wanted to know how could they all just wear the same coat. <laughs> and it was what's wonderful about Chanel is that she not only anticipated that eventually women wouldn't want to be trussed up like turkeys and corsets, but she taught women that it wasn't the coat that made the woman. The woman, we, the woman wore the clothes. Clothes don't wear the woman. So she would tell them, you know, it doesn't matter if you're all wearing the same coat. It will look unique on all of you because each one of you are individual. Mm -hmm. So she did this empowerment thing along with her clothing that really was effective. Mm -hmm. And then when World War I hit, of course, women were suddenly 
working in infirmaries, driving ambulances, um, you know, doing all the things that meant driving streetcars, and they couldn't do that in a corset. So there was this rush on Chanel's clothing. And when she herself said once that when she woke up after World War One, she just woke up one day and she was famous, very famous. It took her a couple more years to break down the barrier, um, the, the, that barrier between designer and society, but she was determined to do it, and she did. Um, also with her perfume, it's a really remarkable story because designers had had perfumes in the past, but nobody had marketed a signature perfume actually well. Um, and most of those perfumes were heavy, musky, flowery scents that designers would actually have made for the atelier. They'd give them as gifts to their high-end clients. And it was a way to keep a woman wedded to the atelier so she didn't shift. Um, Chanel wanted to do a signature perfume, and everyone told her she was crazy to even attempt it. But she had heard of this mythical formula that she wanted to chase down, and this man who had made it, and she did. She also took advantage of a new science that was emerging, which is now standard in the perfume industry, which is mixing alkaloids and chemicals with natural scents because it gives perfume a lasting, it gives that lasting effect. Natural scents fade very quickly. And so she decided that she wanted to make that kind of a perfume. And the number five comes from the test sample because when she had it brewed up and they were presented to her, number five was the one she liked. But what's so serendipitous about it is that number five was always, was always her talismanic number. She was a Leo. She always believed in number, the number five was her lucky number. Um, and all of that comes from the convent, because the pathway in the convent that leads to the chapel has these really beautiful five stars, five pointed stars in it. They're really wonderful. They almost look pagan. And she carried all of that with her. So she launched this perfume really subtly. She actually had the perfume samples delivered in the same type of test bottle that she had smelled. It's that square bottle you still associate with Chanel. She had the stopper designed as Place Vendôme. It's the shape of Place Vendôme. And then she just had all of the dressing rooms of her boutiques spritzed with it. And as the women were leaving that Christmas, she was like, a gift, a gift, a gift. And then she just waited. And soon enough, within a month, these women were coming back going, you have more of that perfume at the opera and everybody loves it. It stays forever. And she launched it with no publicity. She just let word of mouth do it. And it became the number one best-selling perfume in the world, and to this day remains one of the top-selling perfumes. The billion-dollar empire she built right there. She also designed uh, costume jewelry. Everything we associate with costume jewelry is Chanel, um, because she, she got some gifts of real jewelry, and she felt it was ridiculous to walk out the door with like you know $17,000 worth of pearls around your neck. So she thought it would be fun to mix and match it with fake stuff, because she was a practical jokester. So she set up workshops where she imitated um, Byzantine and Renaissance jewelry and started this craze in costume jewelry that, that we have to this day. And it was all to just conceal what was real and what wasn't. Because she didn't feel like it was necessary, that you didn't need to wear estates on your back, that you should have fun with what you were wearing. And then pret a porter is something that we all live with today. I mean, we all buy our clothing off the rack, basically. I don't know if any of you, but I've never been fitted for anything. <laughs> um, and the way Chanel found out about pret a porter was that she was invited to dress stars in Hollywood, and at the time it was a million dollar contract for a year's worth of work, which was an astronomical sum at that time as the Depression. She went, she wasn't impressed with Hollywood. And though Hollywood was very impressed with her, her clothing didn't look really well on the screen. But on her way back home, she went through New York and saw places like Klein's on the Square and these other very you know, low-end clothing where they were literally selling clothes off the rack. And what was happening was these mass manufacturers were going to the Paris shows, sketching everything they could see, and then reproducing them with zippers. So she realized right <laughs> there that for $5, you could be wearing Chanel, if not the label, the association. So being very perceptive of how trends change and how you keep on top of them, she thought, this is the future. Couture is going to be an exclusive thing. You know, women are not always going to want to do couture. And she already had begun some of that with her mix and matching, but she actually went back to London and staged a collection for charity where she invited all the mass manufacturers to go and they could license whatever they saw and mass produce it. And of course, designers like Elsa Schiaparelli and a number of other high-end fashion designers lambasted her for denigrating couture. But she actually was really ahead of the times, and it made her a lot of money and it saved. Um, her business, which was suffering because of the depression, like everybody was. Um, 
there's a lot that's really fascinating about her, and there's a lot that's controversial, of course. Um, her behavior during World War II has, for many years, was kept kind of under the table. Um, and there's been a lot of recent declassification of French intelligence documents and a number of other books that have come out that have accused her of a rabid anti-Semitism, collaboration with the Nazis. Um, some of these books, when you read them, you actually picture her standing in front of the Ritz ready to welcome them with open arms and a glass of wine. The truth is that n that's not true. Um, she fled Paris when the Nazis came in like everybody else did. Very afraid. She closed down her boutiques. As soon as the war started, her comment to her friend was, this is not the time for fashion. And she fled. She went to her nephew's ho home, and his, his wife and his daughter were there. And then she found out some unsettling news about her nephew that compelled her to go back to Paris. And that's the part of the book that it, that's really interesting for me for writing, because exploring the occupation of Paris under the Nazis is a really interesting thing to research, because it's not black and white. It's all gray. People are making choices out of survival. And um, women really got the heart into the stick after the war. The Free French arrested over 5,000 women that they shake their heads, they prayed to them through the streets. Some women were hung from street lamps. And all these women were trying to do was put some food on the table and survive an occupation. that came on very suddenly because nobody expected the Nazis to reach Paris as quickly as they did. She became involved with a counterintelligence officer um, who's very mysterious and enigmatic to this day. Um, we really don't know what he was up to completely, but there's indications that he may have been spying for the Germans, but then as he began to see the tide turn, he began counterintelligence saying, trying to get the Allies involved. Um, so I, I investigated some of that. He's, a, he's an interesting character, very enigmatic, um, very much the type of man Chanel would have been attracted to. Um, you know, he's chic and uh, she liked a man a man's man. And um, he was arrested after the war, which is curious, and held by the English for a number of months before he was allowed to escape, but he was no, charges were never pressed against him. And Chanel was also arrested after the war by the Free French, but was mysteriously let go. And there's speculation to these days as to why. Hmm. Did they not have enough on her? Some people speculate that Winston Churchill intervened, because she was friends with Winston Churchill. But she definitely undertook a mission, a spy mission for the Nazis, which is a um, almost a farce. She ends up in Madrid in a situation that's just completely untenable. There's nothing she could do about it. So that's all in the book as well. Um, she's complicated. Um, she's not always nice. She's caustic and she's arrogant. But I like my women with rough edges. <laughs> that's, that's the way I like them. And I found her quite remarkable, not only for what she did in fashion and how so much of what we know today about fashion is based on what Chanel did, but also how she worked, influenced her history, and how she moved through this enormous swath of history. I mean, from the turn of the century through two world wars and into the 50s and the 60s is quite amazing. My book ends after World War II, but it's bookended by her appearances in 54. She went into a self-imposed exile and came back in 54 and relaunched herself. Mm -hmm. Chanel was always reinventing herself. She had wonderful sayings. Um, one of them was, if you were born without wings, don't do anything to prevent them from growing. And she just was never afraid of shifting or changing. So um, that's my spiel. Any questions? <laughs> about that. So how hard is it to dig past what is understood to be true or accepted as true? It's hard because the documents were only declassified really recently, so I didn't have an access to them. But I saw them reproduced. Um, I didn't have access to them directly, no. But somebody at the archives, when I was contacting them, who introduced me to this man who worked with her, he sent me some mimeograph pages. But, you know, they're in German, I mean. I don't speak German, but I was able to get them translated. It's hard to see what's real and what's not. You know, the Nazis also fabricated a lot of stuff in their papers. They weren't always honest. They, they were obsessive documenters, but they also were never averse to lying that suited them. So, and, and the name of her mission is, you know, Mission Model Hat. 
it's just like, so <laughs> ludicrous. <laughs> you almost can't take it seriously. Um, but it was tough to, to move around because there's, there, it's being divided into camps. Remember, in France, there's a lingering sense of shame over what happened during the war because there was so much collaboration. The Vichy government sent you know, thousands and thousands of Jews to their deaths. And so they, nobody really wanted this to come out. So I think it's a little bit of an embarrassment that this incredible French icon, who's such a bastion of fashion, who's still, it's a billion dollar empire to this day, may have been sleeping around with Nazis. She definitely was sleeping with one that I know of. Um, but the documents don't reveal a lot about the missions. They reveal that she did meet with some high-end high people in the Abrawar, which was the German intelligence division, but there could have been other explanations for it. I, I found a really reasonable one that nobody seems to have been talking about. Even her biographers kind of bypass it. And I'm like, hey, wait a minute, she's got a Nazi who's been captured. I mean, she's got a nephew who's been captured. That, that's an issue here. You know, um, she had very little family, and she this nephew was her sister's son, and she had cared for him since he was a boy, he paid for boarding school in England, and he was drafted into the war, and they caught him as they broke into Paris. And all of those men were set into concentration camps. Yeah. In fact, her nephew never, um, never got past what happened to him. He died of tuberculosis that he acquired in that camp in his 40s. So there are a lot of reasons why she may have acted the way she did. And some of them were driven by survival. I think at that point, her boutiques are closed. She did, she's not presenting clothing. We also forget that people like Maurice Chevalier, who everybody loves, he danced and sang his way through the occupation of Paris yes. every night on the stage. You know, Many of the designers reopened their collections and presented them to the Nazis and their wives. Well, people didn't have food to eat. Exactly. So um, one of the things I try to do when I write my books is I don't want to judge my character. Because the moment I judge, I lose my empathy. I make decisions about them. So I leave the judging to the reader. I present what I think is a plausible reason for her behavior, but it's up to the reader to, to judge her if they want to judge her. But I'm not big on judging anyway. It's just not my thing. No. <laughs> Anybody else? Now, your book covers an, an enormous amount of years. Mm -hmm. Was that a really difficult uh, proposition for you, or you could see what you wanted to leave out? You know, once I researched her life, the arc is so incredible, it's, it's, you can't make it up. You know, she goes from 12, being nothing, no one, scared out of her mind. She just has this arc right up, and it had to end with the war. It had to, because it's where everything that she's learned and everything she's done is put to the test, for better or for worse. So it wasn't really a challenge to me. And this book, it really did kind of write itself which is bizarre to say, I know, but I, I had less trouble writing this book than I've had any of my other books, oh, when it should have been the opposite. Mm -hmm. But she was just someone that I really felt like I understood. You know, I got her, even her, all of her rough edges. I understood them. It, it, it doesn't have to do with working in fashion, though I've met plenty of people like her. Um, I think she just, there's something that I empathize with. So no, it wasn't, it wasn't a challenge. A challenge was to not, you know, I think I had to leave out. Because <laughs> you make choices in a historical novel, and there were things I couldn't include, and, you know, they drove me nuts. I mean, many of her love affairs are in their book, but, you know, girl got around. <laughs> and some of those aren't in there, um, because they weren't relevant to moving the story forward. Um, anything else? I've seen pictures of her apartments, of apartments, and I know it's filled with treasures. Yes. So, did she die a rich woman? What happened to she died life? a very rich woman. <laughs> she, um, you know, her assets and everything were frozen during the war, and she'd shut down everything. But she had money, and she was able to access it later. Um, I didn't get a chance to go into the apartment. I did everything possible. I, I was in Paris, and I had already sent letters in. And, you know, I would have gone and scrubbed Karl Lagerfeld's floor <laughs> for 10 minutes in there, because it's got all of her best stuff, her Coromandel screens. And, but he has that apartment really tightly controlled. But she ended up not having a house. She would, the house she had the longest with her southern villa in Love House, and she eventually sold it. Um, she'd stay at the Ritz, or she'd stay at the apartment, but the apartment has no bedroom. She never had a bedroom built in there. She would just rest on the couch. Because apparently, this man I talked to said she was so energetic that she only slept like two or three hours a night. In her 70s. 
The Ritz is a nice place to live. I, <laughs> I wouldn't kick. I wouldn't kick myself out. Um, I did get a chance to go to the Chanel archives outside of Paris, mm -hmm. and that was a really wonderful experience because they were really nice to me, and they gave me a beautiful gold pin, which I should have worn tonight. Mm -hmm. That's a celebration of the fifty hundred years of her boutique, and um, they're very rare. They're, you can't find them all the time. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't get into the apartment. Lagerfeld wouldn't. Ironically enough, the following month, a Vogue photographer arrived from English Vogue and photographed the apartment. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, Lady Gaga's just been interviewed in there, dressed in Chanel wow. paint. So I think he was trying to restrict access to the apartment because he had these things lined up. He's trying to slowly open it up. He's been very protective of her, of her legacy. Did you ever marry or have kids? I don't no. know if you mentioned that event. Oh. No. She never married, she never had children. She, she, someone once asked her, and she said, I want to be loved, but every time I have to choose between a man and my dresses, I choose my dresses. <laughs> and that's a statement that's very much to know. It isn't about the dresses. It's about what that represents, that freedom, that yeah. ability to make her own life and make her own choices. I think what's wonderful about Chanel and how she still influences today is that none of us still wrestle with the issues she did. Can we have it all? Can we be you know, great workers, can we be great parents, can we be great spouses? And I think Chanel recognized in her life that you do make compromises and you do make choices and she wasn't willing to do it. Oh, I've got a question again. I thought it was interesting when you mentioned that she uh, never had a bed in, in, a, in a... She never had a bed installed no, in the apartment. See, this was what I was wondering. Did you ever want to saw you write in the book uh, whether she felt maybe somebody was trying to was after her, pursuing her, she didn't want to stay any place too long? She no, she yeah. just was restless. You know, as much as if she was hurt by her father and by what happened, she had that same restlessness in her. Mm -hmm. So she wasn't content being in one place. She had, and then you'll, and if you read the book, there's, she has several residences through the course of the book, and she just, she gets these apartments, she decorates them, she spends six minutes in there, and then she's like, yeah, I'm done. Mm -hmm. She just was, it was La Pausa, the southern villa, that she kept the longest. And what's fascinating about La Pausa is that the main staircase in the foyer of the building she sent the architect who built that to that staircase to the convent to actually recreate it in every detail, but she swore him to secrecy. Mm -hmm. For many years, Chanel lied about her past. Her father had abandoned her, he'd gone to America. Oh. You know, she'd gone to a boarding school, not a convent orphanage. She didn't want people to know where she came from. But something about that convent made such a profound impact that she recreated that staircase. And it's still there, by the way. The staircase is still in the villa. The villa's still there. It's owned by a literary agent now. Hmm. Winston Churchill wrote part of his um, memoirs there. He used to go there and paint because he was plagued. Winston Churchill suffered very severely from depression, and he would go and spend summers there. Um, it was the house she held on to the longest, but everything else would go. She had um, Gachet's villa in a suburb of Paris. She had a wonderful apartment on the Quai Tokyo. I don't know if you've ever been to Paris. The Quai Tokyo is a really, really cool place. She had a great apartment there with apparently a black lacquered ceiling. And there were mirrors. And when she walked in, it smelled really strongly of chocolate. And she asked her friend who was showing the apartment why. And he was like, she's like, the guy who used to live here was an opium addict. And he's selling it because he can't get opium anymore because opium smells like chocolate when you burn it. She was so impressed with the black lacquered ceiling and the mirrors that she created the famous staircase in her atelier based on that. So she was like a magpie. She'd take from different things and reinterpret them. But she was restless, and she liked to move around. The Ritz felt like home, but a hotel is transient. That's why it felt like home. You may have already said this because I came a bit late, but how did she become good friends with Winston Churchill? She was dating the Duke of Westminster. Um, who is uh, simple? Like I said, girl got around. Who was one of the one of the wealthiest men in England, the English aristocracy, and he was friends with Winston Churchill. And for a while, she was going to England and spending a lot of time there at this guy's estate, which is huge. It's like Downton Abbey. He is not so pleasant. He was he was rapidly anti-Semitic, and in fact, got up and made several speeches in Parliament against the Jews and accusing. What uh, the black market, the stock market crash on them, and that the same thing was happening to Europe. He supported Hitler, but he was also, I mean, the guy was just generally unpleasant. He was also rapidly homophobic and everything else you can imagine. But he did these fox hunting parties, and she met Winston Churchill at one. It's in the book. Um, and they really liked each other. And how did she meet this Duke? He just. This Duke? She met him at a party. This guy had been asking about her. He, he, he had an eye for 
pretty women doing, he liked, supposedly he liked working people, which Chanel thought, found was really amusing, and she was holding a party in Monte Carlo on a yacht for her 40th birthday. And um, he, he had tethered his, I described it in the book as a beast. He had this enormous boat, he was a very big sailor. He loved to sail. He had this enormous boat that he just pulled up right next to the one she had rented, and he invited her on board. And the whole inside of the yacht, I've seen pictures, he decorated like a manor. So there's like oil paintings on the wall and you know wood wainscoting everywhere. It's really quite funny. And he pursued her. She wasn't convinced that she was interested in going with him. But um, he pursued her and you know, he's a duke and he's got a lot of money. <laughs> Hard to say no. But Winston Churchill and her became lifetime lifelong friends. She, she knew um, Dionne. What, what was the source of their connection, do you think? What, were they both witty or, or what? Winston Churchill really liked independent people. Mm -hmm. You know? What was in one of his sayings? Cats look down on us, dogs look, it up us, uh, uh, look up at us, but pigs treat us as equals. <laughs> um, <coughs> um, he, was a, he was a self made man himself in many ways. Mm -hmm. and. Um, he admired her, her gumption, and I think she admired his his ability to cut past the aristocratic stuff. You know that he was interested in her for her, and um, they found a connection. Also, she sensed in him what he called his black dog, I think, which was his depression, because she was uh, she was at times prone to it herself, sort of a brooding melancholy, like many talented people. You know, you're not quite happy. I always, I always say to myself, really, really happy, or really, really happy people are usually a little bit stupid. <laughs> because how can you be so happy in the world the way it is? You know, you're not, you're not paying attention. <laughs> and I think Chanel felt the same way. And so I think they attracted each other. But he was at La Pausa. He warned her about the war coming on. Remember, he warned Europe that the war was coming, and nobody believed him. And that summer that he was with her, the last summer at La Pausa, before the war, he warned her, he told her, get out now, because it's coming. But nobody heeded him. He's a strong character. He's a strong secondary character in the book. We don't see him a lot, but what we see is fun. And the mission that she undertakes, Operation Model Hat, involves him. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> so, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty great. Anything else? Well, What's thing. your favorite biography? My favorite biography. There's a biography called Chanel, Coco Chanel, by Lisa Cheney. Lisa, oh. Lisa Cheney. She's a British writer. And I think it's the most balanced. Mm -hmm. It's written by a woman. Um, many are, but some recent ones I've read have just been not good. Um, I think people, people feel pressure because of what we know about her wartime things to pass judgment, mm -hmm. to decide the right side, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, and uh, Lisa Cheney doesn't. She actually looks at it impartially. Okay. I noticed that you wrote the book in the first person, like, um, you know, it was you that was having to you were Coco, but sort of if you did any channeling or anything like that. But kind of no, I'm very, I'm very non woo woo. <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> stuff all kind of freaks me out a little Might bit. Might be helpful too, though. Yeah. <laughs> no, I have a friend, I have a writer friend who does this. She, she meets with a medium for her characters. and. She supposedly, Eleanor Aquitaine has come out of the ether to tell her what gown, color gown she was wearing on a certain day. But yeah, I don't believe any of that. <laughs> I think that, you know, to be a writer is like being an actor or anything else. You, you need to be invisible. And there's no reason you can't be anything you want to be if you work hard enough at it to create a character. Um, there's no reason that men can't write women, women can't write men, that we can't be whatever we want. We just have to do the work. Um, and it is very much like acting. You end up stripping away pieces of yourself you, know, you set aside what you think and who you are and just become hollow so that you can feel like that's the characters. What I, that's what I'm saying, channeling yeah. is kind of like that. It's like that, but... Not that I ever did it, right? not that I even support that kind of thing, but people do it and, um, you know... Yeah, well, I, you know, I studied acting for a number of years, um, so thinking I might want to be an actor if I was going to be a designer. Mm -hmm. um, and so I learned some techniques that help with that. Then there are meditative techniques, but it's not like I sit behind the computer and sort of go, um, <laughs> I just sort of incorporate them when I start writing. And oftentimes what I find the best way to do it is to just not work so hard at it. To just let it be, just let it flow out of you. Don't spend a lot of time fussing around going, like, what if I can't get this? Or I don't know what a nylon feels like, or I do actually, but you know, I live three days. <laughs> <laughs> 
um, you know, I, you just try not to worry about that stuff. Trust your instinct. I mean, that's the way I approach it. You want to say anything about your next book? Okay. So it's official, it's been announced. So um, I switched publishers, I went to William Morrow from Random House, and I just sold a book on Marlena Dietrich, which will be out next year. And I also have a novel coming out from Random House still about Lucrezia Borgia, because this my manuscript was delivered to them two years ago, but they, they delayed it. For It's very long and complicated and extraordinarily boring. Um, so next year I'll have two books out. But the Marlena book is, was wonderful too. But really wonderful. And I'm going to be going to Berlin in the fall. Oh. Although most of the book is written, I want to go see the Film House Museum because she donated a lot of her estate there, so that her clothes are there, costumes, posters. And I've already corresponded with them, and you know, the Germans are very delayed, not like the French. Wow. Yeah, they acted like they were doing me a great favor and asked me for everything my contract, a letter from my editor. The Germans were like, sure, we'll set aside a day, just come in. Yeah. <laughs> Drink beer and eat strudel with us. So. <laughs> It'll be good for me, too, because I come from German descent on my father's side, and I've never been to Germany. Oh, so. But Marlene is wonderful, and very different from Chanel, very different type of woman, but also quite revolutionary and scandalous. Yeah. So it'll be fun. All right, well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you.